three days that matter maybe more than any other three days in all of uh, history, and that is the three days of Jesus' death, burial, unto resurrection. But I'm going to call it the three-day test, because even though we see that Jesus died and was buried and then rose again in three days, there's a personal application to this that affects us, that there can be a passage of three days or symbolic passage of three days in our life, which is also testing and proving us. The strange three-day journey when all seems backward, dark, and lost. If you were a follower of Jesus and you witnessed that arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, you witnessed his brutal treatment at the hands of the Romans, you witnessed Barabbas being set free and Jesus receiving the penalty of the criminal, if you saw him scourged with a cat of nine tails, if you saw him pinned to two pieces of wood, and you saw him breathe his last. I don't know that I can say exactly what we would feel, but despair, extreme discouragement, would be a pretty good description of it. Now, some of you could say, but didn't he say that this would happen? And I could say, okay, stop right there. Because many of you have gone through difficult stretches of your life, very dark corridors. And I could say, didn't God say that this was going to happen? And doesn't he say what's going to happen as a result of it? You see, many of us have a struggle with looking at the cross and seeing our Savior die. Or our hope seem to be lost. Or that which we thought was going to happen, fail. And yet those are the moments, I'm going to call them the three-day test, that actually prove our soul, that demonstrate our faith, but also unlock the power of heaven in our life. So the strange three-day journey, when all seems backward, dark, and lost. Wasn't he supposed to destroy the Romans? Wasn't he supposed to take his kingdom? Wasn't he supposed to remove all this filth from Israel? Wasn't he supposed to be our king and our Messiah? He died. And yet, for those of you that know the story, you know that there's a lot more going on than just the failure of our Messiah to prove our Messiah. No, he didn't fail. He is actually succeeding, but you can't see it in the natural realm. In this moment, it's blurry, it's dark, it seems backward, it's not the way it's supposed to be, and this is the moment that proves us. So, betrayal, false accusations, scourging, crucifixion, death, burial, stone, stone rolled in front. <sighs> silence, silence, silence. You ever had those stretches in your life where you really could use some encouragement from God right now? You really could use a flicker, just a flicker, just the hint that God is present and he seems to be silent. That's your moment, guys. This is a three-day test right here. Now, what's interesting, and we all know it, is that Jesus said this was going to happen, and he said that in three days he'll rise again. Why do we forget that in the midst of the silence, silence, silence? So here's the key questions I want you to ask in these moments of silence, silence, silence. Can God lie? He can't. Even God himself says it is impossible for him to lie. Now, he's the truth, and so lies and, and truth don't go together. And so I've asked, I've, I remember asking someone, because this is one of my key biblical counseling questions, do you believe God can lie? Because I'm setting them up. If, if they say he can't lie, well, then I'm going to hold his word before them and say, okay, well, then this can't lie. And, however, this person was being very gracious to God, and they said, of course he can't. He can do whatever he wants. Doesn't that sound like a very nice thing to say about God? That God can do whatever he wants. So if he wanted to lie, he could lie. However, did you know that God cannot violate his nature? Who he is, he is, and he will always be that. And he is truth, which means it is impossible for God to lie. So when God goes silent, 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 and you're in the midst of your three-day test, you need to remember, God cannot lie. Has God promised? So can God lie, and has God promised? He has. This is how you walk through your three-day test. So as Jesus dies on the cross and is buried, and silence, silence, silence follows, can God lie? 
No. Has God promised? Yes. What has He promised? Would be a great follow-up to that. The Word of God on the matter. Now, there's a lot on this matter, but I'll give you one little hint at it. Mark 8, 31. And He, speaking of Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. Can God lie? No. Has he promised? Yes, he has. So even though you're walking through silence, 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 you need to remember the nature and the character of your God in the midst of that. The word of the devil on the subject. Now here's where it gets a little dicey. God speaks, but we have someone else that's a yammerer. And the devil always has his opinion on this matter, too. Did you know that when Jesus is lying in the grave and there's silence, silent, silence, that the devil is hatching plans of his own? And that he's trying to cover this up and he's trying to diminish the power of what God is doing in this moment. Matthew 27, 63. Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. So what are they doing? They're setting a guard around his tomb. They're wanting to make sure that nothing would possibly happen that could actually fulfill these words. You see, the devil is aware of the promise as well, and he doesn't want you to know it. And he wants to set Roman guards out around your life to lest you witness an empty tomb. How are you going to handle the three-day test? The three days of Christ were long ago foretold. So let's just go through the Old Testament. There's going to be seven three-day tests that I'm going to bring up, and we'll go through each one of them quickly. The three-day are you willing test. The three-day will you buckle test. The three-day bitter waters test. The three-day are you ready to try the impossible test. The three-day but I can't go another step test. The three-day if I perish, I perish test. The three-day in the belly of the earth test. So number one, the three-day are you willing test. So this is going to go in chronological order through the Old Testament. So this is going to be Genesis 22, Abraham and his son Isaac. Genesis 22, 1 through 14. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. Talk about a three-day test. I, I, I don't even know that most of us in here, if all, not all of us in here, could fathom this. I think we just know it's a story. It happened in history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to comprehend being asked to take your one and only son and sacrifice him. I mean, there, there's some smoke that starts coming out of our brains on that one. But this is a three-day test in the Old Testament. For those of you that know the gospel, know that this is a parallel this is setting us up to understand the gospel when Jesus comes. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the, place, the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So our first three-day test is going to prove something. It's going to prove a man. 
This man is being asked to lay down his most precious thing in life. This is his hope. This is where he sees his future. Now, each of us has an Isaac in our life. We have the similitude of that in our life where there is something that God needs to touch to truly set us free for what we are called to. Now, this is the end of the three-day test. This is what happens at the end in the mount of the Lord. At the end of a three-day test, it will be provided. What you need in your life will be there. That is the word of the Lord on the matter. That is how a three-day test will end. But this is just the first evidence of that. So the, each one of these uh, tests, I'm going to give you a gospel question to finish it up. Are you willing to give up that which is most precious to you to follow Jesus Christ? That's the question that applies to us. Because to pass this three-day test, you need to be willing to relinquish that which you most value in your life. To receive Jesus, you have to let go of what's in this hand. To be able to grip him, you have to give up those pebbles in your hand. Go door to door and try and sell these pebbles. They're worthless. But to you, it's everything you possess. And Jesus says, I need what's in that grip. Let it go. So that you can grip God. All right, the second three-day test. The three-day will you buckle test. Now, I'm going to use uh, the, the story from Flavius Josephus. I've done this many times in history past. This is a story of the Israelites leaving Israel. Egypt, and they're going to travel, I guess how many days, three days, and end up at the edge of the Red Sea. And they're going to face a test. Many of us crumble, just like the nation of Israel basically almost crumbled at the edge of the Red Sea. It's just a bad situation. I want to give it a new lens. That's why I love reading this passage from Flavius Josephus, who is a historian that was contemporary to Jesus Christ. So from 2,000 years ago, he's a Jewish historian. And this is how he's going to write about that very scene. So Flavius Josephus writes it this way. Now when the Egyptians had overtaken the Hebrews, they prepared to fight them. And by their multitude, they drove them into a narrow place for the number that pursued after them was 600 chariots with 50,000 horsemen and 200,000 footmen all armed. Now, just to uh, give you a little insight into what the Israelites, or as they say here, the Hebrews are dealing with, they have no weapons. They have nothing to defend themselves with unless you want to swing a goat. They don't have the power to overcome the most monstrous, powerful military force in the world at that time is marching against them in full strength, in full array. And they're backed up against a sea. All right? I could say, how are you doing in this situation? This is the three-day test. They also seized on the passages by which they imagined the Hebrews might fly, shutting them up between inaccessible precipices in the sea. The Hebrews, if they should have thought of fighting, had no weapons. They expected a universal destruction unless they delivered themselves up to the Egyptians. There's only one way out of this, guys. We need to become slaves again. That's actually what they're thinking. So they laid the blame on Moses, that's convenient, and forgot all the signs that had been wrought by God for the recovery of their freedom. And this so far that their incredulity prompted them to throw stones at the prophet while he encouraged them and promised them deliverance. Moses is a great symbol of the word of God in this situation. What's he doing? He is encouraging them and promising them deliverance, and what are they doing? They're blaming all of their hardships on him. How many of us do that in the three-day test? When our lives face an impossibility, when we're backed up to something that seems impossible, how do we respond? How do we treat God's word? Instead of believing it, are we picking up stones and hurling them? But Moses, listen to this. This is quite the description of what Moses does. But Moses, though the multitude looked fiercely at him, did not, however, give over the care of them, but despised all dangers out of his trust in God. He said, it is no better than madness at this time to despair in the providence of God. And that's what I would say to you. When you are backed up to the Red Sea, it is no better than madness to despair in the providence of God. Is he not in control? Did he not deliver you out of the hands of the Israelites? Is he not your God? Is he not capable of actually helping you right now? Well, what's he going to do? We're backed up to a Red Sea. Do you know that Moses concluded, and this is what Flavius Josephus says. This is just a fascinating tidbit, just for you to chew on. 
He knew that God could fly them out of there if necessary. He could flatten the mountains and they could, they could walk out. Or he could part the Red Sea and they could walk across on dry land. Aren't you intrigued with the different variations of history that there could be if God flew them out of there? Isn't that just fascinating to think of a whole nation flying out? That was in Moses' mind. God will do something. I don't know what it's going to be, but he'll do something. Is that your attitude during the three-day test? Is God going to be faithful? Can he lie? Has he not promised? So here's our gospel question. Can God fail you? It's a great question for our souls. Is it not true that he is faithful to his word and that it is impossible for him to lie? Is there ever a time when it is reasonable to despair? Can you think of one? Number three, the three-day bitter waters test. So now they have part, the Red Sea parts, I mean, if this nation hasn't had enough evidence of the faithfulness of God, I don't know who has. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. Uh Uh-oh, guys, we have another three-day test. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. By the way, everything I'm saying is a parallel with the tree in the future called the cross. Every single thing that's happening is a picture of what Jesus is going to fulfill, but not just at the cross, in our lives. This is called the gospel of Jesus Christ, and this is how we live our lives. So God shows him a tree. What does he show us? He shows us something very similar. We have bitter water in our life. We can't even swallow it. It's so pungent. Lord, I can't handle this any longer. What does he show us? He shows us a tree. The water, and so when Moses casts it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. And said, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heals you. Gospel question, will he not turn this bitterness into sweetness? I I know that in this room, there's some bitter waters right now. Some things that are very difficult for you to know how to swallow and process in your life. He wants to show you a tree. And he wants to assure you that he will turn this bitterness into sweetness. That is his way. Number four, the three-day are you ready for the impossible test? Joshua 1.1, Moses has passed away and now there's a new beginning and they're ready to take the land of promise. However, what do do we know about the land of promise? It's full of walled cities that reach to the heavens and the people are giants. There's giants in the land and we are like grasshoppers in their sight. Oh, this is what they fell for 40 years earlier, which is why they've struggled in the wilderness for 40 years is because of unbelief. So this new generation is going to rise up and believe. The question is, are you ready to be a part of that new generation that actually believes that God can and will do impossible things in our generation? So God says, pass through the host and command the people saying, prepare you victuals for within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go and to possess the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess it. So the gospel question Is he not greater than the boastings of this natural realm? Look around you. We got giants in the land. We got walled cities that reach to the heavens, and we feel like grasshoppers in the sight of our current culture. Everything you stand for looks piddly and pathetic, and the world mocks it and holds it in contempt. We as the church are in disagreement. We're bickering and arguing with each other. Our biggest problem is internal, not even with the external. They have no, nothing to concern themselves with. We can't even get our game on. Which God do we serve? Do we serve a God made by human hands? Or do we serve a God who is actually God and able to do the impossible? This is the three-day test for all of us. We are called to enter into a land of promise. Has he not given us that land? Has he not said, take a step into the Jordan, I will part it? 
We are called to do something even when the world holds us in derision and contempt. All of Jericho is staring with contempt, like, ha! And then suddenly the waters of the Jordan part. Well, and it's an it's a, it's a audible gulp that you can hear. You see, the enemy is scared that we will actually pass the three-day test and that we will step forward into that Jordan and we will march on this territory. Number five, the three-day, but I can't go another step test. Boy, every single one of these are very familiar in my life. I'm not sure how your life is, but uh, these are very familiar. This is the story of David and his mighty men. 1 Samuel 30. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag, attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captive and that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So the Amalekites in Scripture are a great symbol of the secondborn, or the, I'm sorry, the firstborn of the flesh. And they are going to take captive all of David's mighty men, uh, their wives and children, and all their goods. This is going to so dishearten uh, David and his men. However, David is going to rise up with a response. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. So David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Bazor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Bazor. These are mighty men that are going to be so faint after three days that they're going to stay behind. So David is going to go with 400, and they're going to go after this to get it. And I, I don't know where you fall in that. Have you ever felt like, I can't go any further? You see, David is an incredible picture of Jesus in this story, that he will not relent, and what he wants to do is say, come with me. Now, it's an amazing story because he is still going to share the spoils with those that stayed behind, which is an incredible statement of grace. But boy, do we want to pass this test. The gospel question, will he not cause you to rise up with wings as eagles and run and not grow weary? When you feel like you can't go another step, have you ever said that to you? I can't keep going like this. Well, it's probably true. You should change, right? Something could be off in your life. However, you're also making a declaration that it's based upon your human ability. This was never based on your human ability. God is able. Will you trust him right now? This is the three-day test. Number six, the three-day if I perish, I perish test. Now, some of you will recognize that's good uh, Esther uh, language, and that's what this story is. So Esther recognizes that she needs to risk her life to stand before King Asuherus on behalf of her people. Now, may I emphasize, she needs to risk her life. And this is the three-day test. Do you understand the value of what it means to stand for the truth of Jesus in this world? And she says, go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so I will go in, to the king, go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. That's a three-day test right there, guys, to take that step for truth, for righteousness, to do what you know is obedience, knowing that God has set you here for such a time as this, in this situation, with the voice that you have, with the knowledge and understanding you have, to stand for truth and righteousness right now. So here's our gospel question. Is he not worthy of our entire lives? And even if we die, is his cause not deserving our body and blood? Unless we're answering these questions with a clear mind and understanding his value and his worth, we're not going to pass this test. This is a test that proves the reality of faith within us, that we know who he is, what he deserves, and what he should get out of our lives. Number seven, the three-day in the belly of the earth test. And Jesus himself is going to say that he is going to give the sign of Jonah. He is linking directly to this story, this three-day test. Jonah 1.17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So here's our gospel question. Is he not the resurrection and the life? I know, people don't get swallowed up by big fish and stay in that belly for three days in the 
digestive acids, by the way. In fact, the way I read Jonah is I see that he died. That's the way I would read it. And if you read it too, you'll, you could pretty easily say that all our stories, like our Sunday school flannel boards, don't show that. That's a little maybe too gruesome. I'm not sure. However, I believe he died and actually is a demonstration of resurrection life. Now, that doesn't change the fact that he's resurrection life no matter how you, you cut it. And he is going to be spat out of this great fish and something amazing is going to take place. You know, the greatest revival, recorded revival in all human history is going to take place as a result of what is happening in this three-day test. And this is, this is a guy who isn't even making good decisions. He did, I don't even think he wanted any revival in that situation, right? God is going to get his due. This is a statement of our God and what he does. Is he not the resurrection and the life? The three days are begging an answer. Though heeding your God will cost you everything, though it would appear that the enemy forces outnumber you and you are pinned up against the Red Sea, though the waters are currently tasting bitter, though the enemy has walled cities that reach up to the heavens, there are giants in the land and you appear as grasshoppers in their sight. Though your fuel tank has run low, your spiritual mustard has lost its zest. Though death is imminent and to, and to keep standing strong seems futile and ridiculous. Though the circumstances are wholly impossible. Can God lie? Has your God promised? This is the three-day test. I don't care how bleak it gets. I don't care how dark it gets out there. I don't care how challenging our circumstances can God lie? Has he promised? Because if he can't lie, and he has promised to never leave us, to never forsake us, to take all that the enemy means for evil and to turn it to good. He has promised that no weapon fashioned against us shall prosper. He has promised to restore that which the swarming locust has eaten. He has promised that when the enemy comes in like a flood, he will raise up a standard against it. Has he not promised? but you don't know my circumstances. My circumstances are more bleak. More, more bleak than what? More bleak than the Israelites being backed up to the Red Sea? More bleak than Jesus dying on a cross and being laid in a tomb with a big stone in front with Roman guards surrounding it? More bleak than what? You are not going to face anything more bleak than what has already been revealed to be under God's feet. Our God has proven himself. It's our job to believe him. He has demonstrated his faithfulness for generation unto generation unto generation. He has handed us his word down through those generations. And he has given us evidence of his care, his love, his heart, his faithfulness, his trueness. And he is inviting us to trust him. The three days always end in triumph. Let's try something. He is risen. It always ends in triumph. That's the darkest, bleakest moment in human history, and it ends in triumph? Always. First one, there's a provision of a lamb. I capitalize the lamb just so you catch the hint. There's a provision of the lamb. The parting of a Red Sea and the swallowing up of a dastardly enemy. Our enemy is judged and defeated. His head is crushed. You see, our enemy is swallowed up in the working of God. What looks like we're going to be destroyed actually turns on its head and our enemy is destroyed. It turns into sweet waters. Remember those bitter waters? Yeah, that's actually going to become sweet waters. It leads to the conquering of Canaan. The territory that he has promised will be gained. The destruction of the Amalekites, that firstborn side of your existence, no longer will control you. Old man is dead. The hanging of Haman, the schemer, the one that is trying to sabotage the Israelites or you. Haman hangs on the very gallows that he erects to destroy Mordecai on. And that's the way of our God. And the spitting back out of Jonah. Resurrection life. So I'm going to finish with these two scriptures. Hosea 6.2. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may 
live in his sight. Now, I made live all caps. That is my addition. But I think it's deserving of it. I also don't want you to miss it. On the third day. You see, there's silence, there's silence, there's silence. There's challenge, there's challenge, there's challenge. There's difficulty, there's difficulty, there's difficulty. There's bitterness, bitterness, bitterness. And yet, if we will walk through that with faith, believing our God, and not pick up stones to try and strike the word of God to say, you failed me. God cannot fail, and he cannot lie. He will prove faithful. Your job is to trust him right now. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. So then right after this, oh, we didn't get the, the right uh, keynote in here. Uh, uh, Hosea 6.3, uh, all right, I'll have to give my, uh, my best way of describing it. Can you imagine this, cru this crux of the whole message? Now I have to try and, and I am the one guy who cannot quote anything verbatim. When God promises that he will do something, his action in that situation is as sure as the sun to rise. So listen to this. His action is as sure as the sun to rise. Are you confident the sun is going to rise tomorrow? His action in your circumstance is just as sure as that. All right, and you can look up Hosea 6.3 <laughs> to enjoy that. Let's pray. Father, we love you. You have conquered death. You have conquered our enemy. In the very moment of greatest weakness, you proved strong. Lord, we stand back and marvel at what you did for us. But Lord, may now we live in light of that victory. May we not forget those three days. May we not forget the end of the story. May we not forget that you have promised and you cannot lie. When you say you will do it, you will in fact do it. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in the precious name of our resurrected Redeemer, Jesus Christ, that we pray this. Amen.